Elizabeth had a dream for this world. I guess a lot didn't go as planned. And there are still dangers ahead. Maybe the biggest yet. But after what Beta and I accomplished, I... I have hope. We'll fight for Elizabeth's dream. Together. Very well said. How's it going, everybody? This is JDog X211 coming at you with my final Horizon Forbidden West playthrough video. Now, I know that this is going up. Prop. I know this is going up before. Well, before a lot of things, but I wanted to make sure it got out there before you know the DLC came out and anything uh, might have gotten spoiled. And of course, while you know, the speculation is still a hot topic, and the speculation and theorems for the DLC in the next game are a hot topic of discussion. So, on that note, I like to, I got some personal predictions, a few ideas about the DLC, as well as a few other opinions of my own about, you know, like the effectiveness of Gaia, what sh what tactics they might employ, and a few other things about some per my personal opinion on some machines. So. Let's start with the most important and simple fact. We know the Xenus weren't the real threat. We now know that ultimately, Nemesis was the one who sent the signal that turned Hades into the genocidal machine into the genocidal murder machine that it was. And now it's on its way here to finish the job because Gaia was able to stop it. That was what the Xenus were running from, and now it's coming here. And I got a feeling that, you know, watching them all get massacred by Gaia's machine, by, I guess, Hephaestus's machines, and of course the epic fight between me and Tilda isn't going to satisfy it. That kind of hate isn't satisfied, even if it did it with its own two metaphorical hands. So, what comes next? Obviously, like the Frozen Wilds, there will pr there will most likely be a DLC, given that it's September 12th, I want to say? Mm, no, make that the 13th. My money is that the next DLC will be about Hefe will be about getting Hephaestus. Like it or not, that is the most important thing to grab right now. Mm, let me just check my notes. The biggest problem right now is that, like Guy said, if we don't get Hephaestus and, you know, use them in his ability to control machines before, say, the next year is out, this world is this world might not even be still alive by the time by the time Nemesis gets here. So we're not gonna be able to put that off for years. That's gotta be, you know, the next big thing. Let me see now. It also stands to reason that that will that uh, the next DLC for this will be obviously not uh, will obviously be getting Hephaestus since we already lost it. One thing of note is that when the game when you complete the mission Singularity, somebody else actually pointed this out to me when I was watching another you know another theory video, and they made a stupendous and important point. When you complete Singularity after going to the far zenith island you don't get sent back to before the mission singularity like you did for in uh forbidden like in uh zero dawn you get sent right back here and everyone else gets scattered as we know ava's at legacy's landfall erin is at hidden embers zo went back to the otaru went to the otaru in plain song and Catalo went back to the Memorial Grove to speak to Catal to speak to shit. Why can I never remember their names? I always get Catalo and this is embarrassing. Hikaro, Hikaro mixed up. I always get some of these guys have. Some... You guys, the problem is that they all have very similar sounding names after a while. So now, most likely, the next DLC will be, since Hephaestus is now out in the wild, it'll be about getting him back. 
then we'll be able to then we'll be able to really start getting ready for Nemesis since we'll be able to start pro be able to both start fixing the planet and then with and then we'll be able to also start you know really sending out uh, really start you know spreading the information for Apollo after all we're gonna after all I think the next game a small theory about mine for the next game is that it's gonna be a massive uh, massive multiplayer online game because we're gonna be end up going you know to all the different corners of the world we're gonna have to go obviously to the Quensland we're gonna have to go back to the cut and Banuk uh, no not Banuk we're gonna have to go to Ban Ur we're gonna have to go back to the Sundom to tell Avad what's happened back to the sacred land to inform the matriarchs I foresee a great deal of you know expansion for the world as a whole But yeah, no, that's going to be, I believe, the next game. Uh, reconnecting the world, getting ready for Nemesis. A more important, and also, another fact that is included is that when we try to speak to Gaia now, she says that, you know, she's combing through her data, checking all malicious code, and, uh, ex and that she's basically rebooting and purging herself. My money is that you know when the DLC comes she'll have retrieved a specific piece of information you know kind of like uh, a hard a hard uh, a, a, a server farm wherever Hephaestus might actually be you know you know actually fortifying and setting up as a place because he can't hang out in the cauldron network anymore after he got sucked out of it the first time there's no way he's gonna take that chance so my money is that he'll find himself some actual secret bunker somewhere Probably, you know, like on some deserted island, like maybe out in the middle of the Pacific with, uh, with, uh, Hawaii and all that. Some place where he, obviously, no human would conceivably, without advanced knowledge of the world and its geography, be able to reach. And while that's all, and also while that's happening, there's another major fact. The same way that, the Gaia might have gotten information about where Hephaestus is... There's also the chance that Hephaestus now knows where Gaia is, or at least where she was stationed. Which means that the very first mission we have might be to repel a major invasion of uh, Plainsong and ultimately our base from Hephaestus, from a large batch of combat machines from Hephaestus. That most certainly will be interesting. Kind of like what happened with uh, at the Memorial Grove when Regala attacked us with uh, the ground, with the rock breaker, and the slitherfang. Let me see. Stronghold, hold up, not get caught. Gaia, repel an invasion. Once of course, but once of course that's taken care of, we might be able to access you know a couple of those machines if he sends if he does send you know some more advanced new machines, because he was after all plugged into. The Zenus uh, heart, the Zenus computers for a while. He'll probably send something new after us, and of course, if we're able to hack that, we can pro we can use that to correlate with the data found by Gaia, and that will give us Hephaestus' location, and then we'll be storming the gates there. Let me see, is that everything I wanted to say? Reconnecting the world, getting ready for Nemesis, take place after the revolution. Revelation, Frozen Wild was completed. At any point, because you were sent back before this uh, final mission, uh, mm -hmm. own secret stronghold. Also, like they said, world's gonna die in less than a year, or world's gonna reach the point of no return in less than a year. So next is following this. Following this, most likely, I also foresee that Hephaestus will have a real whopper of a machine. Uh, as a final boss, as a real final boss. At the end of, for, at the end of Zero Dawn, we of course had, you know, a fully 100% operational Deathbringer to deal with, not to mention the swarms of machines that, that, uh, Hades was also calling. But we also had then that massively, like, quadruple HP fire, uh, fire claw to deal with when we were in Cauldron Epsilon. My money, and of course, the 
Spectre Prime for this game. My money is that Hephaestus will have some kind of real whopper of a monster to deal for us to uh, deal with. Which also leads me to suspect another fact. Oh, I guess I don't have one. I guess I don't have one equipped. But the fact is, is that we also... We got no legendary rope caster when we got the DLC or when we when we got uh, the new game plus patch and we also got no uh, didn't get one at all for the for completing the game. This leads me to suspect this leads me to actually well let me rephrase that. What I thought of actually leads into that. One thing that I actually thought of, I'm not sure when I thought of it, but at some point I said something really interesting. I, said, I thought to myself, and I quote, A tarantula with flamethrowers built into its knees. That might sound a little strange, but you can actually think about this in another way. Uh, Hephaestus has taken the designs from the Faro Plague and adapted them in a couple of different ways. When it came to something like the Corruptor, we didn't really have anything different. That was the... the Spectres, I think, were actually based on this one. If you can call it that. But there is something of note. I can't help but think that a Shell Snapper was actually created by Hephaestus in response to seeing the effectiveness of the Deathbringers. I mean, a huge lumbering fortress with, of course, omnidirectional... With, of course, omnidirectional uh, firepower, that certainly does sound a lot like a Deathbringer. So I'm wondering if it might try creating something like a Metal Devil, but obviously significantly improved, since obviously the machines that it creates nowadays are both superior to, uh, to a Deathbringer, and of course it's had access to the new information from the Spectres, the Prime, and of course from Zenith Dawn's own, uh, own, com own computer systems. So, as I thought about that, I came to I came to actually several interesting ideas of what that uh, new machine could be. For starters, it'll have eight legs. So I theorize that four of those legs will of course have omnidirectional cannons, like what a shell snapper and a deathbringer has with the flamethrowers and frost cannons on its sides. But I also thought that it could use four of uh, these energy shields on each of them to cover its uh, to protect itself from being shot at or its main body being fired on since it'll have four of these covering each of its flanks and as I thought about it the biggest regret that the biggest issue that her that the machines have with dealing with humans is that so many of them are of course so big but we humans are very tiny so I thought that instead of using obviously conventional weapons like the energy cannons or the plasma geyser from this from the slaughter fang uh, slaughter spine or the spraying what or the spraying attributes from the slither fang it could use instead trip caster type weapons trip caster trip caster trip caster that it could actually fire a large number of different kinds of trip casters that in turn would inhibit our movement and then of course being a gigantic eight-legged monster it would have plenty it would have you know eight feet to squash us with Pfft. that'd be ironic being squashed like a bug by a bug but obviously you know if it starts spraying multiples of these out especially if it's able to use if it since spiders have two fangs it's logical that it could try launching, you know, two of these at a time. And, if, and even if they don't cover a large area, if it can fire multiples of these in quick succession over over several over several meters or a significant range, well, we wouldn't be able to dodge anymore, and we'd have to actually sit there and take it. Unless you want to get set on fire, charged with plasma, or uh, blown up. And obviously, since 
And that would also make sense why we don't have a legendary rope caster weapon, because that's, of course, where we would get it. Let me see now. What else did I... Mm. Some, spy some spiders spin webs, multiple trip casters, and provide legendary rope caster. Uh, do -do 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 -do. Ah, yes. Next on the list for the discussion is that now we have to talk about the time about we have to talk about uh, the time frame that we would need for the new bots as that would then give we also need to talk about how much time we have as well as some new bots that would be required to fight nemesis let me see where is she Right. One thing that Tilda made sure to say was that it uh, Nemesis sent the extinction signal, but it didn't realize that that failed until the sig until, like I said, the signal was sent back. So it was sent for tw for our what did Hephaestus what did uh, what did Hades say? A little over seventeen years. So six and a half, assuming that it's traveling at about the same rate as the Far Zenith ship. That means that it didn't leave Sirius until. Let's think. The uh, the gestation of Aloy began right when Gaia blew herself up when it received the signal. So it took six years to get there, and another six to get back. And Aloy's about uh, almost twenty years old. So if it took about twenty years to get there, that and it took. And it's and it hasn't and it didn't leave Sirius until after it received the signal, which should have been when Aloy was about ten, I want to say. Just ball, just spitball in the rough numbers here. Obviously, they're probably wrong, but you can find a couple of videos to get me get the correct information online. If that's the case, then that would mean that if it took another fifteen to twenty years to get here, it shouldn't arrive for at least another ten or twelve years. Again, why I say Hephaestus will most likely be the next DLC because the war, like Gaia said, if they don't get Hephaestus back within the next year or so, their the planet will reach a tipping point and then there will be no saving it. So obviously we gotta get Hephaestus before before uh, the deal before we have to get Hephaestus before the new game starts because otherwise there won't be a world to play that game in. But even when it does, but even if it showed up. But even if it shows up, what we have now isn't going to be sufficient, I think, to beat it. Let me see. Signal failed, so it left. Here's a head start. But that's also like I said. But another thing that I said was was that why I think this game will, the next game will take place all over the world, because now that we have Apollo, we have all the inf we have of course all the information that was lost so now a complete record of humanity is is uh, open for us to use so now we gotta start spreading that information and word about nemesis coming so that we can get ready so that's why I believe the next game will be during across the world convincing them what's going on and then connect and then reconnecting so that we can build a cohesive force to stop that well that giant mass of death that's flying right towards us all right, but enough about that. I keep on going back to that. The uh, list series. The next thing that I want to discuss was that we are not actually equipped to deal with uh, to deal with Nemesis at this point in time. The biggest thing about the machines that we have nowadays is that a vast majority of them are, of course, acquisition and transport machines designed to, you know, break down materials, make break down like the scrappers and scroungers to scrap to and of course the glint hawks to deal with to uh, scrap and recycle machine parts acquisition machines to help maintain the biosphere and of course to harvest resources to help to help build the machines and of course and then the transport machines so that they have uh, so that they can move materials from one cauldron to the next and continue the continue the terraforming process but then, of course, the combat machines we have 
like the Dreadwing, the Tide Ripper, the Clamberjaw. Actually, wait, this is an acquisition machine? Okay, let's say Stalker instead. These are these machines are all built to do one thing. To fight against humans. Small, weak, squishy humans. I'm not sure if anybody's ever watched them, but there are a number of videos where they hack the thing, and they drop, you know, like, already overridden machines in the battle against other machines. And if you take a look, I remember an, an excellent fight back up in uh, the Badook territory when they did a Thunderjaw and a Stormbird. That fight took way longer than it should have. Because even though, obviously, the Thunderjaw has such massive advantage with those huge cannons on its hips, they, of course, were designed to f shoot down towards humans. Shoot down towards and at humans, not at a flying target. And, of course, the electricity that a Stormbird uses, while it does pack a punch, wouldn't be very effective against a machine that is already insulated like a Slitherfang. That's why I'm saying, you know, these machines aren't really designed to fight other machines. They're designed to deal with humans. I mean, heck, especially a Dreadwing, since most of its weapons are obviously, you know... We got the blinders to obviously blind us. Stamina drainers. The bomb launchers are nice, but let's face it, those things are designed to cover a wide area to deal with lots of small targets. And of course, the stealth generator wouldn't affect, wouldn't matter to something that actually has radar. Damage damper, noxious container, radar, purge water. All these things are designed to inconvenience, incapacitate, and inhibit a human fighter, not a machine. So we're going to need to design a whole new mess of uh, monsters to deal with to deal with Nemesis. But on that front, we also do have a large number of combat machines already made. So we would be able to deploy them quickly. Not to mention, of course, there are still all of the Corruptors, Deathbringers, Ugh. Sorry, the Corruptors, Deathbringers, and Metal Devils that are left all over the world. So, if worse comes to worse, we can always wake those up and use them as cannon fodder. Since, after all, most of them are just rusting hulks of junk. It wouldn't cost anything, just, uh, with Minerva, the same way it sent the signal that... The same way it sent the signal that woke, that, uh, just, that turned off the Feral Plague, it could turn them back on, but of course under Gaia's control. At that point, it would just be, you know, kill anything that kill anything that's not from this world. And easy enough to follow instruction. Just want to make sure you just want to make sure you got this too. But even on the more versatile machines, the fact is is that a lot of the abilities are mute. Like I said, chemical weapons from like the Spike Snout, the Spike Snout, the sonic abilities from the Clamberjaw, the inhibiting and noxious abilities from the Dreadwing, the Purge Water from a Tide Ripper, the Acid, the Acid from a Slitherfang would probably work. But, for example, these machine the machines that are coming from space would most likely also be insulated. So electricity probably wouldn't work, and they'd be dealing with gamma rays from being on a from not having any ozone protection, so they would experience a lot more intense solar radiation than what I think a fire claw would generate. So that and even plasma from a slaughter spine probably wouldn't do the probably wouldn't do significant amount of damage. So we're gonna have to rely on things like you know, basic projectiles and concussive weapons. Let me see what else we got. Mm. So yeah, we're gonna need a whole new. We're going to need so the next bit. So the next big DLC, like I said, that will be getting the world together on the same page and ready to face Nemesis when it gets here. Then we will also need to overhaul and create some very specific combat machines. 
don't think we're going to have to worry about making anything small, since after all, our enemy is going to be, you know, a giant spaceship. Well, a spaceship-esque cre cre uh, creation that's going to be obviously sending out things like, you know, probably more like jet fighters and stuff after us. So we're going to need some some old school hardware, you know, anti aircraft anti aircraft rounds, uh, maybe EMPs if we can swing that. But honestly, I'm not sure. Some of the stuff these guys come up with is really, really off the wall. I couldn't believe it when I saw a shell walker right the first time. I mean, a machine based on a hermit crab. That was just plain nuts. Not to mention, who would think about using a turtle as a giant walking fortress? Glamour Jaws, ugh, so annoying. And of course a tall neck, tch, <laughs> crazy. So I'm really interested to see what the next batch of machines will be. Both what Nemesis either cooked up or is utilizing, and of course what, uh, what Gaia will come up with. Alright, I believe that's everything. Gonna need new machines, gonna need to reconnect with the world, need to get Hephaestus. That's all the important stuff. So now I want to also discuss a few of my personal opinions about some things. Lean to that design for open world. Open world. Right. One of the big game one of the big aspects I touched on at the beginning of this video was that I believe we will be exploring an open world game actually for the next one. It most like that won't come out for at least another five or six probably for at least another four or five years. And my money, that will also be a major D will also be a major MMO, because we're obviously, like I said, going all over the world and reconnecting with all the different tribes. I mean, we already have we have the Nora, we have the Karja, we have the Osaram, the Utaru, the Tanakh, and the Quen who live across the ocean. So, my money is that that will be an open world game, we'll be doing a lot of exploring. As well as, of course, being able to, I believe, also to pick different... Tr I also wonder if, instead of playing as Aloy, we'll be playing as our own custom character. And we'll be selecting a tribe of which to participate in, and we'll be following missions based on that. That, that will add to a lot of replayability, since we'll be able to choose, you know, six or seven different tribes. And then they could also put out a few DLCs. Because obviously, since we're going to be expanding the world over, we'll be able, they'll be able to add some new DLC downloadable content, which will be different, which will enable us to play as the different tribes that we meet. Because we already have a number of you know specific playable ones. We have uh, the gear, the advanced machinery from the ten, the advanced machinery from the Osram. We have the fearsome fighting ability from the Tanakh, so I imagine them as more hand-to-hand -hand combat or guerrilla tactics. The Karja, who specialize as, you know, artisans and crafters. And of course the Nora, who I imagine would pro who are famous for their bow skills. So I imagine that the same way that, Tana that the Tanakh are excellent hand-to-hand -hand fighters, the, Kar the Nora most likely would have excellent long-range capabilities. As well as, of course, exclusive gear that you would have to, like, trade with in or at different characters across the across different games in order to get. And, uh, all kinds of new armors and trophies to unlock. Hmm. After that... There were a few other things that I wanted to discuss. I already got that one. Why some are useless. Fight humans, benefit from... Ah, yes. Speaking of the machine... There are actually a couple more things I want to discuss, mostly having to do with the machines. One of the big things, of course, is the disappointment that is plasma. Now, I think I understand what their thinking was behind plasma. The deal is, is that, obviously, once you get to a certain state, these machines are just so bulky that you can't really deal a lot of damage to them. Or if you can't, or you know, their armor is so thick that you can't really deal a lot of damage to them, and their HP is so high that, you know, just regular bow reliance on a bow is not efficient, 
and using bombs and uh, and using bombs and lances obviously take a lot of resources. So what you would do is, is that you would charge it. Here, see, this guy's strong against plasma. You would use plasma to, in fact, you know, you'd hit it with the plasma, you'd hit it some more, and then there'd be the big explosion, and that would deal a large chunk of damage. So what they were thinking was is that they weren't that they were expecting you to fight them with bows rather than uh, rather than with heavy artillery. But the problem is, of course, these things have just so much HP that it is a lot faster, even if it isn't very economical, to fight these guys with regular, with uh, explosive ammunition. What I think would make a better suggestion is if... The big thing, of course, is that when you use plasma, it has a specific gauge that caps out at like around five or 600. After that, you can't charge it anymore, and then it just explodes and deals that damage. If, however, they could keep, if instead they kept the timer, but they didn't give it, you know, a cap on how much energy could be stored, that would be a significant increase. Because you charge it with plasma, you deal it damage, when the clock winds down, it then deals all of that damage again to the machine. Essentially, it'd be like setting, so it'd be like using twice the resources, but at half the cost. Because obviously, if you say... I don't know what the hit points on one of the, on what the life on one of these things is. But say, if you hit a Tide Ripper, ordinarily it only de ordinarily once it's fully charged, you, you can't deal any more damage than the five or 600 that pops out of it. But imagine if, as you kept, you could just keep adding to it. So every time it, that, that gauge fills up, it resets, and then that automatically deals another 500. Then you fill it up, it resets, and you deal another 500. So eventually, by the time that thing goes out, you could theoretically deal, you know, 1,500, 2,000 points of damage to it. And all the while, it would still take all the damage that you initially hit it with. That, I think, would be a significant improvement to it and make it a lot more usable. Because, like I said, right now, plasma just doesn't do enough damage to constitute its, uh, its usage. Not when you can just freeze or... Not when you can freeze or spray acid on a machine instead. And let me think, what else would I do? What else do I have I want to say? There is also... There are actually two more things I want to talk about. What, who, the machines that I would use in my own personal army, and also a question I have imposed. It's that, why are there so many machines? Back during the, back when Ted Farrell was in charge, he created the Chariot Line. But that only had the Corruptors, or Scarabs as he called them, the Deathbringers, or the Kopesh, and of course the Metal Devils, or the Horuses, as he called them. Now obviously, you know, you had the small, the small, fast, and agile uh, scarabs. These guys were like the foot soldiers. Then you had the kopeshes. These were the big heavy hitters that, you know, you call in when you needed to lay artillery down and destroy something instead of just, you know, di dancing around it. And of course, the... And of course, the B7 Horuses. Those were the real monsters. They, I guess, were like an actual mobile base. Obviously very useful and, of course, huge and po hugely powerfully destructive. But that was really all you needed. Assuming he didn't have... He, we haven't seen any aerial units, and we haven't seen any, any you know, nautical units. And they never mentioned that if he had anything for that would function on the sea or in the air. So, assuming that that's it, that was really all you needed. He had these guys for speed and agility and to get into small places. You had the big bots for widespread devastation. And you had the horses that kept everything supplied. So then why, for example, why do you need grazers, chargers, lance horns, fang horns, I was actually trying to see if there was another machine I could think of, but no, there actually isn't. But yeah, no, the grazer, the grazer, the plow, the grazer, the charger, the lance horn, hell, even the spikes now in the fang horn. These are all, you know, acquisition machines. They're designed to, you know, take things like grass or naturally occurring elements and turn them into blaze and biofuel. But why do you need 
more than one kind of machine. Obviously, you know, spike stouts also break down machines as well as natural resources. But why, for example, do you need a charger and a grazer and a fanghorn? Or actually, no. If you have a fanghorn that dissolves natural resources into convertible biofuel, then why do you need also a spike snout? And of course, when it comes to a long-range combat machine, why do you need a stalker, a ravager? Let me think about what I'm saying here for a second. Why do you need, say, if it comes down to transport, why do you need a roller back and a behemoth? Why do you need a fire claw and an ice claw? Why do you need, say, a bristleback, as well as, of course, like I said, a spike snout? And why do you need a scrapper and a scrounger? Often see impact with soon torque machine parts or health shock attack from far. Often see impacts break down machine carcasses for recycling. So it's like these guys have basically the same description. Natural resources, usable materials. Natural resources in the biofuels. So it's like, why would you need two of the same thing? My theory is, of course, that because Gaia is using machines, it feels the need to have, you know, a wide variety of a wide variety of machines for each ecosystem, if you will. A grazer is, of course, out on the open plains and in the forest. Lance horns are for are for, you know, tougher, more arid climates because they have, you know, drills instead of the little fan horns that they have here. Chargers deal with more mountainous and, sh and uh, rough terrain. Bristlebacks, of course, deal with salvage that they dig from underground. <coughs> Wide Maws specialized are amphibious, so that's their advantage. But, of course, but of course, each one has, but actually... Right, Wide Maws have tusks that grind up materials, and Snap Maws... Hmm, actually, what's the difference between a Wide... Was a Snap Maw do that a Wide Maw doesn't? Hmm. Question for another time. But the point is, is that I believe that Gaia is actually, was actually trying to create an actual cohesive environment because it was using actual animal morphologies as its base. But like I said, in my case, I would only have like, you know, one or two machines specifically to do a job. As said, grazers and lance horns, one for, you know, rocky terrain, one for softer, for transport machines, I would just use Leap Lashers for small stuff since they're faster and more agile. And of course, Behemoths to carry heavier loads. <coughs> but that's just my opinion. And let me think, is there anything else I wanted to discuss? The benefit way to improve Plasma, next game, DLC content, the legendary Ropecaster I was thinking about. Oh, there was actually something else. This will be the last thing, I promise. One, somebody that I saw actually suspected what the next final boss would be. Give me a second, please. Yo, true or false, the busiest, if you are, if you live in a town, it is an unwritten rule, the busiest street in town has to be either Elm, has to be named either Elm Street or Main Street. Because I swear, 911 just keeps on going by, day in and day out, hour by hour. Anyway, one of the, one individual who I was watching their video and they actually suggested that perhaps given the specters you know more fluid design they actually as well as of course what they managed to do with the Slitherfang and their newfound appreciation of the Tide Ripper they actually thought that the new boss machine instead of being a spider bot like what I thought which would emulate the the Horus and the Metal Devil they might actually go for something like a giant octopus machine which I do think would be very cool 
but I still like my spider idea because then we will be able to get the legendary rope caster like I suggested before. <sighs> my throat's dry and I need a drink. Anyway, that is officially my last, this is officially my la the last time I'm making a video for Horizon Forbidden West. So, keep looking forward to my new content and when I'm done with this, we w you will get to see what my next project will be. I already know what it's going to be, but like I said, I'm only going to be putting out these first and then we'll get and then we'll be getting moving on. So, until next time, this is JDogX211 signing off.